very expensive Botox. Okay. So Miguel then um, went on YouTube and to figure out how to tie the bow tie. So this is his bow tie. And you'll see that it's not John. John said he did a pretty good job considering it was saying he's so much to tighten it up a little bit. But this was Miguel's <laughs> tightening of Dr. McDonough's tie. He gave it. Okay. He's, he's 15 now um, going into the tent, into the life. And, and, oh my God, it's a soft These are old. Okay. So the adult patient versus the child patient, they are different. Children. Remember back from the pediatric days, children are not just small adults, they, they really are different. Okay. Um, obviously the adult gives you the history directly if they're uh, awake and aware. Uh, a child will need his parent um, to convey probably some of the information, if not all of the information, uh, depending on the age of the child. Um, adults, our somatic growth is complete, although we may be getting wider, we're probably not getting taller, uh, shorter probably, <laughs> but the child's growth is continu continuous and it's very predictable. Uh, and we have ways of looking at whether their growth is within the time. Um, an adult has completed all stages of child development, so if you look at, at Kohlberg's moral development or Piaget's um, 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 cognitive development um, or Erickson's um, psychosocial development, um, the adult has ostensibly completed all of those, though you know, some of us may get there, but some of us <laughs> remain children forever. Um, but a child, again, is predictable in terms of how the development occurs and what we would expect a child to be able to do or how we would expect them to think or reason uh, depending on, on their age and their age. So the child is constantly changing. Um, these are just the age classifications. These are, are, are the characteristic ones. Uh, newborn, birth to one month. Um, sometimes they'll say six weeks, depending on what sort you do. Infants up to 12 months. Then toddlers one to two to three years. Preschool three to four. School up to 11 and a half. And then the age 12 um, to 18 to 20. Depending again on who you read. Many people consider adolescence all the way through age 20. That you really don't get out of adolescence until you're 21. Um, so the world of pediatrics, when you're seeing a child, um, the majority of, of, the, of the time that someone sees a child in an outpatient setting, it's going to be for health supervision um, and for development, assessing those, those things. Um, growth and nutrition, immunizations, um, anticipatory guidance, a huge thing with children um, in, in terms of helping parents understand what they should be expecting of their child coming up between now and say the next time we can see. So well child visit is usually an interim history because most of the time the child stays with the same pediatric provider or family, family uh, provider. Um, and so, so most of the visits are going to be interim histories um, and looking at growth and development. Very, very critical because that tells something about not only um, uh, how they're developing in terms of those three areas, psychosocial, moral, uh, cognitive, etc., but also uh, can give implications for what their overall health might be. Uh, for example, what might you think you give a clue um, to, uh, to a provider or to a, to a parent in terms of how a child is doing in school. If you have a child who's done who's not doing well in school, what might you suspect? Vision. Hmm? Vision, Vision would be would be one thing. Can they see? Okay, what else? Okay, nutrition. Okay. Okay, so what's what's going on at school that might make them not want to go to school? Besides a test? Besides <laughs> like bullying? Uh -huh. Depression. What is their psychological? What is their home life like? Oftentimes teachers will think about that and suddenly see changes in behavior or changes in how a child is doing at school. One of the first things they'll like know is how it comes to school. If there's a divorce that's going on in the family, 
users of the real world. Then that's what affects how a child does in school. So how they do there has implications for our health. So one of the questions I always ask children who are in school is how's it going? Communicating with children, remember children can understand better than they can talk. So be very careful about what you say. Because just because a, a two-year-old or a three-year-old doesn't understand the words that you're saying, or I can't tell you exactly what's going on with them, doesn't mean that they don't understand at least some of the words you're saying and they misconstrue some of the words you're saying and get really scared. Open any question is always a good thing. Um, and then um, use it, use as many different types of things as you can when you're trying to communicate. So use of dolls, letting uh, children play with equipment, those types of things can really decrease the anxiety that might be going on in the situation. Play, play can be used, um, is used very effectively in terms of, of uncovering um, things, um, psycho psychological things that may be going on. But also, play can be used to bring the child into what's going on in the examination. Um, so, if they can listen to their mom's heart and listen to your heart and listen to their own heart, then they're more likely to let you listen. Uh, explanations um, at their level. Explanations at their level. Um, also, with a child, well, with anybody, but especially with a child, don't lie to them. Okay? Don't tell them something's not going to hurt them. Not a good thing. You will never trust you. Communicating um, with families, you need to involve everybody who's there um, um, to the extent that that's possible. Um, always, I do this with, page, with adult patients too, but encouraging the moms, dads, caretakers, whoever, to write their questions down. And then because of the distraction of the two year old running around and examining and trying to have a conversation uh, with, the, um, with the provider. Um, the, from the question to Remain not non judgmental <laughs> as much as you can because you want to be objective in terms of interpreting the, the data that you're getting the verbally and by watching. Um, and respect and encourage the feedback. Really important. We talked about that in general with, with the health history at the beginning. Um, we really want this to be uh, something that is guided by the patient, or in this case, the parent. So respect it when they do. The health history. Um, what's unique to kids? Okay, not not what we do for everybody, but what's unique. Um, it's really important to know about the household, what, who's in the house, okay, and who the caretakers are. Okay, so is the, the caretaker might be the dad, the caretaker might be the grandmother or the auntie. Who's the caretaker, and who else is? So are there other children in the house, other adults who live in the house? Um, that's important to know about. Any history of violence and abuse? Again, just simple questions. Are you safe? You know, if the child is old enough to answer the question, you know, are you safe where you are? Feel safe. Um, um, what do, what, what do parents do? What occupation do they have? Is it possible that they have exposure to toxins that they may be bringing? Uh, birth history, especially with children six and under, uh, when they're over four to six, you probably don't need uh, uh, at, at, at as much of this, but this is the child's own birth history. Um, what was the what was gestational age were they born? So were they born prematurely or post Can you say those ages again? Which age? You said for birth history for less than six. Four, four to six. Four to yeah, four to six. Okay. It's just critical. Yeah. The younger child. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so gestational age, um, the birth weight, how many days do they stay in the nursery? Do they have any complications, et cetera? And then any m maternal complications. Uh, did the mom get good prenatal care? Um, and did she have any infections during the pregnancy? Um, any exposure to drugs, alcohol, et cetera? So in an adult or an older child, we're really not, not, that's not as quick as that for the other child. Newborn problems, again, for the younger, younger ones, uh, prematurity, how far, you know, you get the gestational age, 
did they have, if they were premature, did they have any respiratory distress? Especially if they have respiratory distress syndrome. Jaundice um, and uh, how much jaundice, what type of jaundice was it? Okay, those who've been to the nursery, there's two types of jaundice. What's normal jaundice? Physiologic jaundice is jaundice that occurs after the first 24 hours. And that's normal, absolutely normal. The, the billy can go as high as 14, 15, 16, and they need to be treated to the physiologic jaundice. It's called physiologic, and it's a normal response, and it occurs after the first 24 hours. And what happens is, in utero, the baby's got a lot of extra red blood cells that they don't need once, they, once they're delivered, and so the body begins to break down the red blood cells. What's the, what's the, the result of that? Increased billy rhythm, okay? And so they get jaundice. And that's normal. If it occurs in the first 24 hours, then that's called pathologic jaundice. Mm -hmm. And the most common cause of pathologic jaundice is RH We don't see that as much anymore, RH incompatibility. Um, we don't see that as much anymore because uh, if, if they've had prenatal care, then we know what, the, what their RH type is, and she's gotten prophylactic uh, Rogan uh, during pregnancy and at the time of birth. So we don't see it as much now as we used to, but if somebody comes in with a different pair, it's absolutely possible. Okay. You can also get pathologic jaundice with an ABO in <coughs> The mom's O, and the baby is A or B or AB, then you can get ABO in the as well. But again, that's, that's much less much less. Um, so then you also want to, again, you need to look to the child, you want to know a developmental history. Now ideally, you have the records of when the kids have been here before and they've got growth charts up to date, they've got developmental tests and up to date, etc. Uh, so that's the ideal, so you can look at that. Um, but how much weight and height has the child been since the last visit? Um, where are they? Um, when did they first go over and sit up in those milestones? Okay. And parents, um, the caregiver, <laughs> I gotta be careful now because a lot of times there's two or three parents and there's no caregiver, but the caregiver can usually pretty much tell you precisely when these things are, um, especially if it's their first child. By the fifth child, you get them all mixed up. <laughs> it was normal, whatever it was. Okay. Uh, is the child in school or daycare? Um, what happens when the kids first start going to daycare? They get sick. They get the respiratory tract infections. They get ear infections. infections. They get the infections. They get uh, RSV is probably the most common. Uh, this place is visualized, um, uh, especially in the fall. Um, um, what grade are they in? How, how are they doing? We talked about that. Okay. And then, were the, did the child have any standardized tests done previously? That was nice to know. Had a demo, or they had ages and stages, or something like that. So, because that gives you an idea, you're looking at that today and assessing are they where we think they should be um, um, via where they were the last time they were seen. So, they developed them. If you get dietitian on everybody, with a child, an infant, we want to know um, are they breastfed, model fed, and what type of formula, if they're on formula, what type of formula, how much, how often. Okay? Um, introduction of solid foods. When do we start solid foods? Four to six, six months. months. Recommendation by everybody known to man, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, is that children do not need solid foods until six months of age. That part of the problem we have with, with pediatric obesity has to do with the fact that we're just giving them solid foods much, much cheaper. It's also implicated in the number of food allergies. Getting those, those types of um, we're getting solid foods too early. The older child, um, do they have a variety of foods? Uh, 
now, you know, a toddler oftentimes will only want one thing. You know, my kid will only eat hot things. All my kids will eat is hot things. That's going to go away. That's called a cereal, not C E R E A, called S E R I L. Cereal food likes. Okay, and kids go through that. Toddlers are the choice. And you just, okay, it's all going to use hot dogs, then give them hot dogs. In two or three weeks, it'll be something else. Okay. Uh, but introduce a variety of things. Okay, because a lot of times you think about yourself, if you remember, others, uh, remember when you were first um, introduced to different foods, you, you, you taste something and you don't like the taste of it, or you don't like the texture of it, or you just don't like it. But two or three years later, you'll love it. Okay? And so you just keep, I encourage your parents to keep introducing uh, different foods to them. Um, sometimes they will never want to eat that. Um, how much junk food and how much juice and soda? Parents think juice is a wonderful thing. Juice is not a wonderful thing. Juice is loaded with sugar. Um, even the ones that's, that say natural, juicy juice, they eat 100% juice. But if you look at the carb content and sugar content, it is horrendous. So they should be drinking water or milk. Okay. And when they get when they get over two to three years of age, they should get yeah, sick. Um, the adolescents were concerned about dieting, uh, purging, binging, over-exercising, and those types. Um, and then the immunizations. Are they up to date on the immunizations? You don't have to memorize it. No, I don't know it by heart. Just, I look it up. It's just a schedule that every year or two changes. So I just look it up. Uh, psychosocial and major changes. Okay, I think I'm going to say divorce, uh, uh, disunity, disharmony in the family, a grandparent. Mm -hmm. Um, those types of things, <laughs> right? <laughs> those things disrupt the child's normal routine. Okay, and although it may be, we, we may see it as a very positive thing, it does disrupt things, and children get really into it. <clears throat> Habits: Do they bite their nails? Do they suck their thumb? Uh, Bedwetting. After six, you really don't worry about any of these things. After six, then you get checked out physiologically. It's going to be very up to age six. Head banging. something that they sleep with all the time, that they need to be able to bring that with them. Even into the OR. It can be wrapped, it can be put into plastic something and taken into the OR. <clears throat> and if you don't want it in the OR, at least they can have it in the pre-op holding area until they get real back, until they get sick. Um, that is no, that is Nanny. That is the second one. <laughs> That's the one who's now 12. He's my baby. Um, then you want to know if the parents have anything they're concerned about. Okay, so again, you're going to get a lot of it is, unless it's from an adolescent or an older child. You're going to get most of this from the family. Um, with the adolescent, there is an assessment called the HEADS assessment, um, where you're looking at uh, a variety of things that have to do primarily with risk behavior. What kind of risky behaviors is this child engaging in? How are things going in the home? Who's set, set, several questions you've already asked. How much time do you spend? Um, what do you and your family argue about? Okay, well, if they're 16, it's got to be the car. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if they're 15, like Miguel, it has to be with when can I drive? Uh, I want to drive to the school. 
Um, the E is education and employment, so the school, what grades, what kind of grades are they getting, what do they like in school, what don't they like in school. So you're getting to know them a little bit with that. Do you need extra help? This is some of the cognitive things. Okay. Do they work before and or after school or on weekends? How much? Um, do they cut classes? Activities, what do they do for fun? Are they in sports? Do they exercise? So you can read through all of these. Do they hang out with, with, who do they hang out with? Who are your friends? And what kind, what do your parents think of your friends? That's an important thing. But that, think back to when you were a teen. Did you know which people your parents did not want you to hang out with? Yeah. Um, and they were usually the ones that were your best buddy. <laughs> And what do you do for fun with your friends? Okay. Drugs. Coffee, tea, or caffeinated beverages. That's, you know, we don't think of that as a drug, but it is. Okay. The caffeine, you need to know about everybody. Okay. Do any of your friends smoke or drink or use drugs? Have you ever tasted alcohol? Depending on the age, many of them will have. Um, the cage question, are you familiar with cage? Mm -hmm. Quick way to, to look at um, whether we need to be concerned about um, their alcohol. Um, what drugs have you tried? And again, if you ask the question, if the question that you ask is, do you use drugs? Your answer oftentimes would be no. no. But if I say, what drugs do you use? Then that says to them, it's okay for you to tell me that. If I say, do you use drugs, then I'm kind of telling you that the right answer would be no, because they know the right answers. But if I say, what drugs do you use, what alcohol have you tried, those types of things, then that says, I think that people your age might be doing that, and so you can tell me about that. That's true. Um, how did you pay for the drugs? Why would you ask that? Sexuality. Okay. And so this is the area most individuals, um, providers, become much uh, very uncomfortable with in talking to adolescents or adults. Okay. Is the area so okay. Are you attracted to boys, girls, or both? Reality. Like, did you ever wonder if you would go to a Exploring what they're thinking. Do you have a boyfriend? Do you get along well? Do you have sex? So again, asking the questions tells them that you're interested in that and it's okay for them to share information. Uh, do you know how to say no? Okay. And do you know what no? That's not on here, but do the one I always like to follow up with is do you know what to do if somebody says you to do it? I have three grandsons and a granddaughter. And they all of them say no means no, regardless of what the issue is, whether it's sexuality. No means no. Um, and um, we've had that discussion since they were very young. Do you know how to protect yourself from STDs and pregnancy? Um, that's an uncomfortable question for parents to ask or for anybody to ask. Um, but we need to know if they, if they know. I had a, um, a cousin who died last year. Um, very right wing, very, um, very conservative Christian. Um, and uh, we had a discussion with my team, my girls were in their teams. And he said, I don't know how you can tell them all about this stuff. Because after all, you know the concept. And my answer was, I know what I wish for my daughters. However, God did give them free will. And should they choose, I want them to be safe. And that's the philosophy. And that's my philosophy when I'm talking with teenagers as well. Um, not that I'm encouraging you to do anything, but I think you need to know how to be safe should you make the choice.
Um, and then suicide is depression. This is a um, Do you ever feel really depressed? How long does it last? Okay. Um, was there something that triggered that? A specific thing that triggered it? And have you ever thought about hurting yourself? Um, that life wasn't worth living, or hope that you were in the next sleep or in the way So you're asking, <coughs> when they say, yes, I thought about hurting myself. I thought about it last week. I don't want to wake up. And I know, you know, the correct response is to stay with them and to, uh, you know, make sure that they get help. What was your initial response to that be? How do you respond to that? Do you have a plan? Well, the first thing I want to do is to assess the lethality. Right, so there's a lethality, a lethality uh, escalation. So you thought about killing yourself, and you, or you thought about how you want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I was, I'm going to shoot myself. Do you have a gun? Okay. And you just follow it up. And the more, you know, if, if it's just I thought about it and I really don't want to wake up tomorrow, then I'm going to get them counseling with them. But as that lethality goes up, then we're going to we're going to take them or send them to a counselor. Yeah. 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 And you know that you can be suicidal. Who doesn't be suicidal? Because you think you know it every minute. Um, and so um, and you've got this whole thing going around with the internet uh, suicide right now. Um, and teens are all aware of it. Okay? And not only are they aware of it, but they know how to get to the sites where it tells you how to do it. I mean, it's really, it's really a sad state of affairs. So finding out what they know about it is important. Because, again, remember when you were a teenager, it is, your teen years are schizophrenic. They just are. I mean, life is hard. Everything's changing. Your body's changing. Your mind is changing. Um, Everybody around you is changing. Nothing is the same, and you feel totally out of control. Um, so you're either there in the midst of this chaos, or you're the person who has the, the, the feeling that you're totally, in, totally invulnerable to anything. And so then you have the, the risk. Nothing's going to happen to me. It can happen to anybody else. It won't happen to me. That's the other side. So those are the ones who engage in all these behaviors without even without a second thought because they don't think it's going to happen to them. Um, and so as a provider working with adolescents, you just have to keep those, those things in mind. And then safety. Okay. Um, do you ever feel unsafe at school that we get a bullying, uh, the bullying aspect at home um, or in the neighborhood? I mean, some of the some of the individuals that you work with live in neighborhoods that are not safe. They're just not. Um, so the answer would be yeah. I don't feel safe with them. I wish I could say yeah. Do um, your friends carry weapons? You only got do you have a weapon? Okay. Do you fight? Have you used weapons other guns in the home? Not that that's a bad thing. There are many families, especially in the South and the West, that have that have guns in the home. They, they collect guns. They, but you want to know how safe those things are in the home. So far. Have you ever run away from home? Been, around, been homeless? A lot of kids have been homeless. We, we go down to, uh, to uh, the Clara Barton, uh, Clara Barton uh, Clara White Mission um, downtown, which is a uh, uh, mission for homeless individuals. We do breakfast at some of the local churches. The heartbreaking thing to me is the number of teenagers and young young fam families with very young children who are homeless. They're out there. In our world, we don't think about those. You know, many, many kids who go to school, kids who come uh, in for a variety of reasons into, into a healthcare situation who are homeless. So those are additional things to think about in terms of the history, in, you know, in addition to all the other things. So what's different about the physical? You want to minimize discomfort okay? um, and use games and distractions I've talked about. Okay? Um, offer a gown if it's appropriate, okay? but a lot of the exam can be done around the course. Just leaving things out of the way. 
Um, you do have to be flexible when you're working with a child. If you're not worked with mentor kids, you can't say, okay, I'm going to start here and I'm going to move in my nice little because this is the way I learned it to, to, to get through my walkthrough. I'm going to do head to toe so I don't forget anything. You can't do that with kids. you got to do what you can do at the moment. So when they're screaming, that's the time to look in their mouth. Okay, and look at their tonsils and their throat um, when they're sleeping. When they're sleeping, that's when you listen to their heart and their lungs and uh, the things where you need quiet. Um, and you want to save the, the most invasive, fear producing, and more painful things for last. Okay? So, so the last thing, when I'm doing a child, the very last thing I do is look at their ears. Because most kids uh, have a thing about ears, looking at ears, especially if they have a history of uh, ear. Uh, infants, um, the goal is to determine their expected growth and growth milestones. So again, distraction. Um, except with infants um, and, and in the early toddler years, stranger um, anxiety and separation anxiety. So they don't want to. Most of the through around age two or even three, depending on the size of the child. You can do most of the examination with the child in the caregiver's lap. You don't need to put them on a toilet to the same table. Um, be flexible, okay, and try not to wake the sleeping papers that you need to. Um, observation um, is, the, is the best, best thing for them. Um, turning, to a, to, turning to a sound, so uh, if you have a bell or snap fingers or lightly clap your hands uh, and they turn your head in that direction, that gives you a kind of view. Um, toddlers, uh, developmental language development, um, uh, allow the child to touch and play with your instruments with the, with the, uh, anything that's safe to play with. Um, and we talked about uh, examining the pen first. Okay. Um, allow choices when that's realistic. Don't say, can I look in your ears now? Because if the child says no, what are you going to do? <laughs> so, I'm going to look in your ears. Would you like me to look at the right one or the left one first? Or I need to look at your ears. Would you like me to do that now? Or later, okay. but not can I was <laughs> um, When in doubt, look at the chart. Okay, so um, pediatric norms um, are 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 just that they are normed on a particular population. Um, some norms, most of them, are on standard charts. We'll look at those in a minute. Um, but also vital signs of developmental milestones, those depend on the age of the child. Um, growth is your anthropometric measurements. Uh, falling off the growth curve. So here's an example of a child. And we see that this child has the, the, the growth uh, weight for age. The weight has been plotted across um, from birth to 30 to about 32 to 30 months. Okay. So, what would you say about this growth? Okay. Um, so, the child at birth was in the 50th percentile, went up to the to the 60th percentile, then dropped back off. And has been kind of dropping since then. Yeah. Now that may be normal. The child is still in the in the, between the fifth and, and tenth percentile, but it would be a concern to start to, to keep watching this in terms of whether this is a normal growth curve. By the same token, if we've got a child who's plotting like this. Okay, then chances are we're looking at some of these things. Um, and we have that nice presentation on the three So if we have a child that what's the outcome of this, just follow it for the 
Um, there would be a lot of questions being asked in this this particular case about the child's eating, uh, how much they're eating. Uh, the, you know, again, this is still in the toddler years between two and three. You know, we began to see this kind of moving off. So it may just be that the child's a real picky eater at this time. Okay. Um, so we, we would get find out a lot of information about the nutrition and then also about any signs or any other signs or symptoms that may be taken out the nutrition. But I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't be totally blown away at this point, but if we continued on this and stayed down here just between the 5th and 10th, that's where the best rule is. What I don't have here is the, is the length, okay? So it may be that if, that if the plot was weight for length, that it may be appropriate. So it may be that this is just a small plot, okay? but I don't have the length on this. So there are charts for weight for age, there are charts for, for length for, for weight, um, and there are BMI charts again, um, like we talked about last week that we can engage to. The other thing besides, besides the length and the weight is the head circumference. So head circumference is, um, is a measurement that's important up to 36 months of age. So most of the growth charts, you'll have one from birth to 36 months, and that's the one that will be used for the first three years, okay? because it will include the head circumference as part of what you're measuring. Um, and it should be between one and two years of age, um, the head circumference should equal the chest circumference. Initially, it's going to be the head So heart rate um, in children is going to be more labile um, than in adults, so it's going to respond more quickly to fever, um, activity, et cetera, and you'll see that spike in the uh, contact part of it. Um, and um, it's very common um, in infants and children to have, to, to have some PVCs that are absolutely normal, non-pathologic at all, if it's going to be there. And then sinus arrhythmia is absolutely normal uh, in, in children. Uh, can be normal in young adults as well. Okay? But when you see a sinus arrhythmia, if you think of a sinus arrhythmia, you have to think about other things that could cause it in brain damage. Okay? So what makes it a sinus arrhythmia? <laughs> Okay, so you've got a normal, if you have an ECG, you have a normal, normal looking QRS T complex itself. So you have P for every QRS, et cetera. And what happens is that when, I call it kind of a squeeze. So when the child breathes in, um, it, that increases the pressure, intrathoracic pressure. So it squeezes the heart, and the heart rate increases a little bit. And when they breathe out, that, that, that pressure decreases and so the heart rate slows back down. So it's not it's not like jumping from 80 to 120, okay, that you will see if you're feeling the pulse, if you're listening to the heart, you're gonna, you're gonna notice this in, in so if you're hearing or feeling something that seems irregular, then watch their breathing at the same time. And if they're synchronous between their breathing and and what's going on in their heart rate, then that would be considered and more if you need more. Do you ever have to, like if you see sinus or anything, do you ever have to investigate it further? Like this is a shadow help question, and I put like, oh, man. but the model said that you have to make sure there isn't, it didn't say that the child had anything wrong with them. So if the child looks normal and no medical history, do you have to do anything else? Well, and I think the, the point that shadow help was making was that you didn't have enough of the scenario to know that there was not something else there. So you would have to invest, you would have to know, are they symptomatic, are, they, you know, are there other things going on in the scenario they gave you have that information? Mm -hmm. So yes, you would have to know that. Mm -hmm. Are they having any, any symptoms, any shortness of breath, any, uh, any palpitations, etc., mm -hmm. um, which would indicate that it might be something more than a simple sense. So going with that question, I also had points to get off because I said, you know, if you did all those things, science or is common in kids, um, and then there's no intervention for it. 
and I got a message saying that there is an intervention for sinus arrhythmia. Um, so I would take that. What would you do? I don't know the intervention for sinus arrhythmia. I didn't mean this. What's wrong? Or what, is there a differential diagnosis? I think that was the actual yeah. question. Yeah, because because they could be having they, they could be having a uh, have to have a tachycardia or uh, uh, irregular heart rate from other conditions like anything that could cause that could cause that. So and the idea is that again, if you're asked for a differential diagnosis, you have to think about anything that might cause the heart to have periodic accelerations. And you're right, exactly. The most common thing is science of the It's a child. There's no other symptoms that are not behind that. I'd have to look that up. I don't know even why you would try to treat the science. It, it is a science. Of the okay, respiratory rates. Um, um, more responsive to illness, exercise, and emotion as well. Uh, special patterns, periodic breathing. Um, they'll have periodic times when they just stop breathing, okay? and that's normal in infancy. Um, and diaphragmatic breathing um, is, is very normal. Other than that, um, you know, the bite, um, for, for infants um, up to two years of age, especially up to 12 months, but, um, a lot of teachers will say up to two months of age, temperature should be taken rectally. Um, um, although um, uh, there's some some people who say no, we don't want to traumatize the child. It's it's the most accurate. So development broken broken development are orderly and sequential. Okay, development is cephalocal. Okay, so it goes from head. To, to down the spine. So they're going to be able to control their head, lift their head up, etc., before they can sit or crawl or walk. Just neuromuscularly, they're going to be able to do that. So the cephalocaudal. And I, in my other one, I had pictures of my twins. The twins were, um, were born at 32 weeks and they were three and a half and three and a quarter pounds. So they were very different ones. So cephalocal. And it's also a proximal distance. Okay, so they're going to be able to do things with their trunk, like turning, long before they're going to be able to coordinate arm movement or hand movement. And it's increased, increasingly integrated. So they do eye-hand coordination, um, and then they can then they can self-feed. When they first start to self-feed. You know that they're not ready to self feed when they put their feet in their eyes. <laughs> a good point. Um, and it's more differentiated, it's more specific, and the <clears throat> behavior is much more specific as they develop further. further. So, that, so the baby is just going to cry because they're hungry, because they can't do the other things crying, where the toddler may go to the refrigerator or point to the cabinet and have the snacks on. So one of the developmental principles is that there are periods of time that are, that are considered what are called critical periods, times when, when things uh, should be happening. Um, but there are many factors that influence how that's going to happen. So although we talk about development as being, being sequential in this way, um, and that most children will do this by six months, and this by nine months, and this by 12 months. Every child is different. Okay? And helping parents understand that is really important because they've got the internet. Okay? And they go on my baby, and my baby says that my child at five and a half months should be doing X, Y, and Z, and my child is only doing X, so something's wrong with my baby. Helping parents understand that. Especially if they have children before. My first two children walked by the time they were six months old. But by golly, you had them be a walker and they were walking at all times. But they're not supposed to do that, they're not walking. Uh, and this child is now seven and a half months old and still not walking. Well, it's normal for a child not to be walking at seven. Okay. So, the developmental theorists we talked about Piaget, cognitive development. Um, 
Uh, and anybody remember PSA? Formal operations and concrete operations. You might want to read that. I'm sorry? You might want to read over that, okay. just in terms of understanding the terms. Okay. Um, moral development, the two people who really looked at moral development, Kohlberg is the big one that looked at moral development. The problem with Kohlberg was that he worked with with bolts on it. And so he developed this developmental theory around moral development. Um, and then when that's applied to girls and, um, and women, we look less moral <laughs> because it was predicated on the way the boys think. Okay. Well, I mean, do we know that boys and girls think differently? We do. We understand the world differently. We interact with the world differently many, many times. And so Gillian came along and she said, well, actually, <laughs> she, did, she did studies with, with women and in fact discovered that there were some differences in the way, not in the overall development, but in the sequential sequence of development between the boys and girls. Psychosocial development, good old Freud, um, but then Erickson's the primary one. Um, so assessing, we're looking at um, cognitive development, actually looking at cognitive delay um, or learning disorders. Um, and you can usually spot those, can't you? And you can spot them in people that you just interact with. They're just having difficulty cognitively. You work with them in patients who've had strokes. Um, um, looking at symptoms. And then language of development, um, not only the use of words, but also articulation speech. Um, are they talking? Okay. They don't have twins, or anybody was a twin? Um, what happens with twins and speech? Uh -huh. We have our own language. You have your own language. Yeah, you have your own language. And but they don't need to talk to anybody else. And so they don't. And if you don't understand them, it can be pretty devastating. My, my, I have twin grandkids, and my daughter called me, and she said, kids were now you know, physically and everything, and, and, and everything, their development and everything was, was farther ahead than the community. They were about 18 months old, and they were uh, going to the Navy base, and they had seen the same pediatrician the whole time they were there. That guy left, new pediatrician. Uh, we need to send these children to the development because they're not sleeping. He said they are speaking. No, they should be speaking in full sentences and they should be not and that, that, that. And so Pam is all upset. That's her perfect kill children because my daughter also has to everything has to be perfect. <laughs> her perfect children are developing the way. I said there is nothing developmentally in the way to develop those children. However, you know, you, they told me how to develop Malcolm. So she took him down and she was scared to develop. And so they took her, they took the, the twins in and they talked with them for about five minutes and listened to them talk to each other and said, why are you here? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with these kids. <laughs> okay. So, but if you don't understand that, um, then, then it is. I mean, they still, well, they still had their own twins, not as much, not nearly as much as it was. And then they didn't really talk to anybody else. Talked to each other. Talked all the time to each other. <laughs> Nobody could, have, could anybody understand what you, what you were saying? They just hear us laughing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine growth gross motor, you're looking at gross motor delay and fine motor delay, and hopefully you don't find it. And then the social development. You're looking at all of those things. So there's two primary ways that most uh, most um, uh, in most pediatric we use. Um, either the Denver Developmental Screening Test, or DDS-2, uh, which is good for birth to six years. And it's not an IQ test. It's not used not to diagnose, but simply to look at where they should be. Um, and there's 125 tasks. I'm going to write a picture. Okay. But basically, what you do is there's this list of Behaviors. And 